Well, this morning as we dive into God's Word, I invite you to open a Bible to Matthew 28, or you can follow along in your bulletin with the Gospel reading. And we are going to be looking at a lot of Scripture passages this morning as we are in the middle of a sermon series where we are focused on the purpose of the church, the purpose for us gathering together, being called by God to be at church together. What does that mean for us? What does that look like as we faithfully obey God's word and follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit wherever he leads us? And so last week, I gave you a handout and it gave you homework to join us in prayer. And we'll be bringing that up again because I'm nice like that. And I, in case you forgot or you lost it, I printed more. They're out there. I really will give you another one. And so this week, we're talking about missions. We've talked about mercy. We talked about fellowship and how in response to God's grace and mercy in our lives, we share God's love through physical means by meeting the needs of those around us, by spiritually caring for them and bringing God's word of comfort to them. We talked about last week fellowship and how that means that God has made us his family, that as this collection of sinners and people that sometimes get it right and sometimes get it wrong, God has through the blood and resurrection of Jesus, brought us together to be part of his family for the purpose that we would encourage each other, lift each other up, and share that gospel invitation with the world around us. And this morning, about missions and what it means for us to go into the whole world and to share the gospel. Now, I'm assuming most of you before today have heard the Great Commission, right? That, that Matthew 28 reading, right? Now, we hear it. And how many of you are like, that's a good plan? Anybody agree with Jesus' plan? All right. Now, how many of you, this is where you got to be really honest with me. Not me, but God. Okay, he's watching. <laughs> you hear the Great Commission, you go, that's a really cool plan. Man, man, Jesus, he laid it out for us. You know, we, we always ask ourselves this question, what What's our purpose? What are we supposed to do as a church? And Jesus told us here in the Great Commission. And then we go, but it doesn't sound realistic. Anybody ever had that? Maybe you don't say it out loud after the reading. But everybody ever had that thought in their heart like, that? Ah, that doesn't sound realistic. Or maybe to personalize it, that doesn't sound like it was meant for me. It was meant for anybody. You just going to put to someone else. It was not for me. It was meant for you, right? And I've had this happen. I remember I taught on the Great Commission well, more than once, but one time when I was doing it, I did have someone come up to me after a church that was not here, so stop looking around, okay? <laughs> and go, well, isn't that what we pay you for? I was like, oh, okay, that's a weird way to think about things. But we do sometimes think about it that way, right? We are this is a wonderful plan from Jesus. How many of you think Jesus really meant the things he said? Right, like you would be like, I would actually like my disciples to do this, right? But sometimes we either go, oh, that doesn't sound realistic for us to actually achieve, right? And sometimes if you have such a ridiculous sounding goal, what do you do? Anybody ever give up before you start trying? Like, this is never going to happen, so why waste our time? Or... The other way we sometimes excuse ourselves from it is, now nah, that wasn't meant for me. That was meant for the missionaries. That was meant for the pastors, right? I just came from the, the district, from the commissioned workers and the, and the people that are called into church work. Now, here's the deal. The disciples, when they first heard this, didn't get all excited about it. They actually responded in a similar way to us. It even says that Jesus had directed them to go to this mountain and verse something. When they saw him, they worshiped him. So what did they do? They, they got together as disciples, and they did what? They worshiped Jesus. What do we do right now? We've gotten together as followers of Jesus, right? Brothers and sisters in Christ, redeemed by him, and we're worshiping him. And then they say this, but some doubted. Right, So you have the crucified, risen Jesus. They're worshiping him. He has clearly told them throughout the last three years, here's what I want you to do. 
And then in response to this wonderful, holy moment, some of the, un, and at least Matthew was nice enough to not name them, right? <laughs> He's just like, some of them went, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure about Jesus. I'm not so sure if this is really meant for me. I'm not so sure if Jesus is talking to me or if he's talking to, maybe he's talking to John because he's the one that Jesus loved the most, right? We could come up with all kinds of excuses. But then in verse 18 begins what is commonly called the Great Commission. Jesus said to them, all authority and on heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that is one of the lines from the Great Commission that's usually left off of the Great Commission. When people say it from memory, we jump right to the, go therefore make disciples of all nations, right? But that's not where it starts. Jesus begins commissioning his church. Notice it didn't say just the apostles, it said the disciples. This is the whole church. So if you were like, I'm not an apostle, we know that. I'm not this, I'm not that. Well, you're part of the church, so Jesus is speaking to you. And he begins by saying, I want you to understand something. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What Jesus is saying is, I won. I have authority over sin. I have authority over death. I have authority over Satan. I am over all things. And that's his way of proclaiming the gospel. He's saying, because the gospel, gospel happened because I won on the cross and through my resurrection, victory over sin, death, and the devil for you. Here's how I want you to respond. See, sometimes we don't do the Great Commission because we forget the God. Now, that doesn't mean that I think you walk out of these doors and I call you later this week and say, hey, it's pastor, just checking to see if you remember the gospel that you're going to stumble on the phone and be like, oh, no, I don't remember. Right? But it's something that Luther uh, wrote about and preached about, that it, we, we often forget it in how we live our lives out from the day-to-day -day interactions that we have, that we, we often forget about it when it comes to our identity. We get so bogged down in our own selfish desires, or we get so bogged down in our sin, we forget what Jesus has done for us. So Jesus doesn't begin sending you and I out as his church to share the gospel, to do the Great Commission by giving you a crushing weight that says, here's what I want you to do. He begins by saying, here's what I've done for you. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to think, well, it's not going to work or it's a ridiculous goal or their hearts and minds are never going to to change or they're never going to want to listen because why Jesus says no no you see I have authority over all things in heaven and on earth meaning there's not a sphere of existence that Jesus is not sovereign and ruling over including your home and your family and your neighborhood and your workplace everywhere you go Everywhere you and I open our mouths and share the gospel with someone, Jesus is saying, I have authority there. I'm in charge there. I'm in control over that place and over that conversation, over that situation. See, the motivation for the Great Commission is not, hey, well, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Jesus told us to do it, and pastor won't shut up about it, so just the... Uh, well, we'll do it this week, and just, he'll be happy. He'll leave us alone. I won't. But <laughs> you could try. Before doing the great commandment is, is the gospel itself. It's Jesus telling you, I, I have victory. I have won. The word gospel literally means a proclamation or a news announcement of victory for the king. That's where it came from. It was a military term in the ancient world that meant the king has victory and now we're telling everybody about his victory. So when Jesus says, see, I have authority over all things in heaven and on earth, he said, I've won the victory. I have conquered sin, I've conquered death for you, and I have conquered Satan, meaning he doesn't rule anymore, Jesus does. Meaning that wherever we go in our lives, he is there with us ruling and reigning, which is why the end 
of the Great Commission is not, please go do more. But it's a word of comfort and promise which says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So when you and I obey Jesus out of celebration of the gospel and go, I want other people to know that Jesus, the king, has victory for them. Victory over their sin, victory over death, victory over the devil working in their lives. So I'm going to go tell them about Jesus. And you get terrified. You're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm afraid of how they're going to respond or how they're going to act. We remember the words of promise that Jesus says, I'm with you always. Always includes what? Those moments, those conversations, those situations. So see, our motivation for sharing the gospel, for doing the Great Commission, for doing mission work as a church and as individuals is not, well, it's the right thing to do, and I just, I got to check it off my list and say I did it. But it's because we are in love with Jesus. We know who he is and what he has done, that he has earned victory for us, that he has authority over all things. And there are people in our lives and in the world that know that Jesus has won victory for them as well. See, when Jesus gives us the Great Commission, he's not actually giving us anything new. He's reflecting the heart of God from the very beginning. So in Genesis, everything is awesome, right? It is great. It is amazing. And then God creates people, (laughs) and it falls apart in one chapter. You're like, you don't have to read your Bible very long to go, and we're in trouble now. And there's consequences. There's sin. There's fractured relationships. There's pain and sorrow. And there's even death now because of it. And God's response is to Adam and Eve, to humanity is, but I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to send a savior who's going to crush Satan. What does that mean? He's like, well, it means that Satan's going to be defeated and he's not going to rule and reign anymore. Jesus is going to. So when Jesus announces, see, now I have authority in all heaven and on all of earth, he's saying, see, I, I completed the promise for you. I have crushed Satan. I have given you victory over sin, death, and the devil, just like God promised from the very beginning. And then when Jesus comes to earth to bring that promise about for you and I, he makes an announcement. He says, the kingdom of God is here. He said, I'm I'm here to bring God's kingdom of grace and mercy and forgiveness and light in the midst of the kingdom of darkness that you and I exist in because of sin and the fallenness of this world. And throughout the gospels, Jesus will often tell his disciples, they don't get it, right? Oh, here's why I came. Be arrested and suffer and then die, and then on the third day rise again. And they go, what? And then he says it again, and they go, no, that's not going to happen. We're not going to let it happen. And then he tells them to shut up. And then he says it a third time. And they go, well, we're just going to run away this time. And so they run away. And then what does Jesus do, though? Exactly what he says he's going to do. And at one point, Jesus even summarizes his whole ministry this way. He says, the Son of Man, that's him, came to seek and to save, anybody know? The lost, the good church people already. No, right? It's the lost. So when you go... So why did Jesus come? What was his whole purpose? And he even tells you in his word, he says, now I came to seek and save the lost. I came to save those who are sinners, those who are a broken mess, who, who don't have life together and mess it up over and over again. He says, that's who I came for. That's his whole purpose. It's so when he gets to his, the great commission, he's not telling us any did it. <laughs> There was this promise way back in Genesis that God would fix all the brokenness of sin and that God would defeat Satan for us. And he says, I showed up and I even told you that's why I'm here to seek and to save the lost. So when he gets to the great condition, he's saying, I did it. I have the authority now. I have that victory now. And I've given it to you as my followers. 
See, the root and the foundation of our motivation for the Great Commission and to missions is a celebration that Jesus is our King who has victory over sin, death, and the devil. And here's the good part. It is totally for you. It's not just for you. And so he tells them to do something. Verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So Jesus tells them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this good news of my victory, of what I have done for lost sinners, and I want you to bring it to the nation. Now, sometimes, I brought it up earlier, we feel like, that's a big goal, right? Think about how many people are in the world. You're like, well, that's a lot. Imagine how they felt. There's 11 apostles, and some of them are doubting, and they're looking at each other like, we've never left Israel, like ever. If you look at a map in the back of your Bible, it's this very tiny section of the map that they've never left before, and Jesus is like, no, I think you guys could pull it off. Now, how many of you standing there would have been like, now I have some serious doubts that he's talking to me? Because it sounds ridiculous. But Jesus says, I want you to do it. Now, when you're at seminary, you're forced to learn Greek. And one of the things that you learn in Greek is about these things called participles, which means they end in I-N-G, okay? That's a word that ends in I-N-G. That's the way to understand it. And it means it's continually happening. So when you read verse 19, it says, go therefore, it's actually a participle, not a command in the Greek. What Jesus is saying is, while you are going about. So he's not saying a command where you're like, I'm going to do it, and this July is the trip I take, and I'm checking it off, and I'm never doing it again. That's one mentality you could have. You're like, see, you know, I did it. I went to that one place that one time. But Jesus doesn't say it that way. He doesn't even actually give a command. He just says, while you're going about. So another way to read it is, therefore, while you are going about, make disciples. Of only, what is he saying? Well, when you wake up in the morning, and wherever you're led, wherever you're going, wherever you go out throughout your day, throughout your week, that's when you do the Great Commission. You see the difference? One is, I can segment this off <laughs> to one trip my whole life and get it over with, and then I can tell Jesus, I did it, and now it's their turn. What Jesus says is, no, it's, it's while you're going about your life. That's when you do the Great Commission. That's when you and I have opportunities to share the gospel, to share the good news that Jesus is our king who has victory. It's not just a one-time thing. It's an assumption from Jesus that says, you're going to be doing this, so I'm going to tell you when you're going to be doing it, which is wherever you're going and whenever you're going. Here's a, here's a mindset shift that needs to happen in all of our own hearts and the hearts of Christians everywhere because we are selfish and we don't always obey Jesus. But here's a mind shift that needs to happen. We need to go from thinking that the Great Commission is a suggestion from Jesus that we need to prayerfully consider, right? So in the real world, what do we tell people? I'll think about it. When you're a Christian and you want to sound churchy, what do you do? I'll prayerfully consider it. You mean the exact same thing. You're just trying to sound holy in one version versus the other, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you have done that? Let's just all admit our guilt. Okay, I've done it too. Like, I'll prayerfully consider it, meaning, no, that's no, I'm just being nice about saying no. We can't do that with the Great Commission. Jesus didn't say, I would like you guys, after I ascend into heaven, to prayerfully take under consideration sharing the gospel with the rest of the world. Right? <laughs> That's not there. I'm promising you. Even in the Greek, because some of you are going to be like, what's the Greek say? Is It's not there. Okay. What does he just say? While you're going about, 
And whatever you're going about, make disciples. Share the gospel. Tell people that Jesus is the king who has given them the victory that they need. So we need to shift from taking it as a suggestion to something that is a necessary part of the Christian life. It's not this optional thing that, oh, I'll do it now, but we view it as, no, that's my whole life. Because Jesus is king, and he is my king, and he has given you and me the victory that we need. And he says, now I have authority over all things. Guess what that includes? Your life. Like, oh, no. Because how many of you want to be in charge of your own stuff? Anybody? No, no hands? Okay, so you're all cool if I'm in charge now? I see not as many hands went up now. Okay. (laughs) Right? But that's what it means to be a disciple, to say, oh, no, Jesus has rescued me. He is the king who has given me victory over sin, death, and the devil. And now my life belongs to him because he has authority over all things. And so... As I follow him, worship him, I'm telling other people about the victory that he has given to them. Now, how do we do this? Well, if you turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 10, this is one of my favorites. I'm obligated to say that every week now. All right. Romans chapter 10, one of my favorites, right? So I want to emphasize that this is not an optional thing. We're gonna have a voters meeting later in June. Guess what we're not gonna vote on? Whether or not we do the Great Commission. You know why? Because it's in the Bible. And Jesus said, go do it. We're not gonna be like, oh, should we or should we not? But Romans 10 tells us why it is so vital. Because Jesus has ascended into heaven, y'all. And who did he entrust the great commission, the sharing of his victory and the sharing of his good news with? The church, disciples of every generation, which means now that's up to who? You and me and every other Christian. And guess what? If you read the whole New Testament, one of the things you will learn is he has no backup plan. He's not like, and if they don't get around to it, no, he just says, this is what you do as my church. So before we read Romans 10, how many of you would like more people in the world to believe in Jesus? Show You really got to raise your hands right now. How many of you have not just people out there, but people in your life that you would like to see believe in Jesus? Cool. So we're all on board with the Great Commission now, aren't we? Because that's what it is. It's bringing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, wherever and whenever we go, to the people that God leads us to. Sometimes it will be across the globe, and sometimes it'll be right across the street or across the cubicle or across the hallway of your own house. So Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 10. Wonderful words of promise. For at the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's that's the foundation, right? That's the gospel, that whoever believes in Jesus is what? No matter what, if they're Jew or they're Greek, they're Gentile, no matter their background, no matter their nationality, ethnicity, no matter how many sins they have in their past, no matter what things they're struggling with now, the promise of the gospel, the free grace of God is if you believe in Jesus, if you call on his name for salvation, God's word says you're saved. That the victory that Jesus says in the Great Commission belongs to him, he says now, now it belongs to you even though you're a poor, miserable sinner. And you and I have a choice in how we respond. We can respond by going, that's wonderful. Let's close the Bible, say a prayer, 
do the benediction, and go about our days. That's one choice we have. We could do that right now. I could stop talking. I can't actually, but in theory, hypothetically, I could stop talking right now. We could just wrap it up and say, isn't that a wonderful promise? I'm going to go home and enjoy it. That's a choice, right? Problem is, it's not the right choice. It's not the faithful choice, not the obedient choice, because Paul keeps writing. And after Jesus and the Great Commission announced his victory for you and me and for all sinners, he kept speaking and telling his church what to do. And so Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right? So it's like, how can they call on Jesus? They don't know who he is. Now, if you're not paying attention, wake up. And if you're also not paying attention, these are rhetorical questions. This is not an opportunity for you and Paul, the apostle, to like have a debate about whether or not this thing can happen. He's asking rhetorical questions. The answer always being what? Well, they're not going to. That's not a trick question, right? The answer to Paul's question is, they won't. All those wonderful promises of grace that we just heard, Paul's saying, all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and he will save you no matter who you are. Paul's saying, well, if they never know who Jesus is, guess what they can't do? Call on his name. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? It's really impossible to say a prayer to Jesus if you don't know who his name is, right? You can't say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I believe in you. If you don't know the name, Jesus. And how are they to hear without someone Preaching. Now, the word preaching here is la leo, and I'm saying that for a reason, so you cannot make the excuse of, no, that's you. <laughs> la leo means just to publicly share. You can do that. How many of you have Facebook or Instagram or Twitter? That's for the whole world to see, right? That's public, whether you want it to be or not. <laughs> so the question becomes, and how are they to hear without someone publicly sharing. What's the answer, y'all? They're not, right? They can't. And then Paul goes on, and how are they to preach or share unless they are sent? Now here's a wonderful question. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, who was he sending out into the whole world to share the gospel? Raise your hand. (laughs) That's you. That's your job. So when Paul's saying, how are they going to, the answer is, well, you and I have already been sent. So if we're the sent ones, we're the ones that are called to what? Share the good news. Here's what I want to emphasize with you. The sharing of God's word, the sharing of the gospel, the sharing of the victory of King Jesus is necessary for the salvation of others. It's not optional. That's what Paul is saying. He's like, how are they going to call on him? How are they going to pray to him? How are they going to believe in him if they... The answer being what? They won't. Which means that you and I have a necessary purpose, a necessary mission as individuals and as the church to take that wonderful free gift of grace and victory that Jesus has given to you and me and share it with others because the only way they're going to believe in Jesus. Now remember, I'm holding you accountable now because earlier in the sermon, unless you already forgot, I asked you how many of you want to see more people believe in Jesus? We all raised our hands, right? Now we made it personal. How many of us have people that we know that we want them to believe in Jesus? Now, here's the job. Here's the purpose. Here's the mission. They're only going to believe in Jesus, according to Paul, if what? 
someone tells them who Jesus is. And Jesus said in the Great Commission, it's wherever and whenever you go. There's a very, very good chance that Jesus has led you to them for a reason. That you are their missionary. That you are the one that the Holy Spirit said, this is the person you're going to tell Jesus about. So that they can call in the name of Jesus and what, according to Paul, be saved. Now, German, <clears throat> you're welcome. There's this sheet here, and if you lost it or don't have one, there are extras in the back. I will be happy to give them out to you. So each purpose is listed. There's Bible verses to go with it, and I'm asking. Asking every single person to pray and say, how am I going to specifically pray for God's work in that area amongst us to happen? So how am I going to pray? What am I going to pray about? Who am I going to pray for to see the work of the Great Commission happen in and among us and through us? So I told you before that Ephesians 4 says the ministry belongs to the saints. And so as leadership and spiritual care, we've been meeting and praying and talking to other leaders in the church and meeting and praying and sharing my own dreams and thoughts. And there's one, and I told spiritual care leadership, I was like, this one's not negotiable. <laughs> All right, I was like, I'll take input on the others. But here's one that's just not negotiable for me. And even if I have to do it on my own, I'm gonna do it on my own, so. <clears throat> there are three billion people on planet Earth right now that have never been told the name of Jesus. I just want you to try to comprehend that for a moment. It's not that they just don't believe in Jesus or that they've rejected it or the Holy Spirit hasn't worked in their lives yet, but there are three billion people on the planet who have not heard the name of Jesus. There's not enough Christians in their country or in their place to be sharing the gospel. So there's two things that I'm just going to bring up a lot, I guess, <laughs> that I want our church to be about. One is partnering with organizations like Lutheran Bible Translators who take the word of God and bring it to people who don't have the word of God in their own language. How many of you have a Bible at home? Yeah. We've got a, a few hundred here at church right now. I've got a bunch at home. Lots of different translations of English. One of the things that we've been so blessed with is access to God's word, right? That every Sunday I'm able to do what? It's the same sermon intro every week. Anybody got it memorized yet? Go ahead and open up. Bible. And what are you and I able to do? Open a Bible and hear God's word in a language we understand. So there are organizations like Lutheran Bible Translators go into the world and say, there are people who don't know Jesus and they don't have access to the Bible in their own language. So we're going to do something about that. Church is saying, that's something we're going to do about. We're going to, we're going to make a change in that statistic. We're going to make a change in that number. The other thing is that I want our church to be a missionary church. Well, that it is sending ourselves and members out on short-term trips locally, nationally, and globally, or it's partnering with missionaries all over the world because there are three billion people who have never heard the name of Jesus. And I would like to spend my life making that number smaller. And I would love for our church to say, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to make that number smaller. So it's something to pray about. Think about I'm probably going to mention it a whole bunch so you won't forget. But at the end of the day, we, we have to be obedient to God's word as a church. We have to take seriously Romans 10 where Paul says, this is how you get saved. You believe in Jesus. But we also have to take seriously the Romans 10 where Paul says, but you're only going to believe in Jesus 
if you get told about who he is. And it's our job as a church and as Christians to say, let's take that gospel and that message of Jesus as far and wide as possible. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your victory, that you have conquered sin, death, and the devil for us, even as we are broken sinners. And that simply by your grace, by calling on your name, that you forgive us, redeem us, and rescue us. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be a people that are so transformed by the gospel that we would spend our whole lives together as a church sharing that good news of Jesus as far and as wide as possible so that more and more people will know about the grace of Jesus and the victory of Jesus for them. In your name we pray, amen.